Thank you everyone for coming to this newest installation of the Long Range Colloquium organized by the Virtual Science Forum. My name is Vala Fatemi and I'll be the host and moderator today. Um, and for those of you joining for the first time, the Virtual Science Forum is a volunteer run, open source organization uh, aiming to facilitate online scientific discourse, particularly in the form of seminars and conferences um, like this one today. If you're interested in helping with the efforts or getting involved in some way, uh, you could either join the group or organize um, some session like a mini conference. Our webpage is linked in the chat. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, uh, uh, the Kavli Institute for Nanoscience in Delft. And I'd, we also have another announcement for which, uh, Babak, could you, uh, uh, could you take the lead there? Uh, yes. Uh, hi, everyone. And I'm Babak Sarajer from Indiana University. I just wanted to make a quick announcement that um, actually together with Vala and Mason Barkeshli from uh, Maryland, we are um, organizing a mini conference on observing anions um, based on some recent experimental work. And I am putting a link to that in the chat as well. If you can see uh, the information, the format, and also register for that. It's on October 5th in three weeks. Thank you. Thanks, Babak. Um, and yeah, in the same vein, this, this meeting is our Long Range Colloquium series, which is bi-weekly at this on, on Wednesdays at this time. Um, and in two weeks, we will have Ted Ramrushan from Google uh, giving a seminar as well. Um, today, though, we are very excited to have Michelle Deveray, who will tell us about some exciting new results in uh, an area that uh, has, I think, long been close to his heart in, in, in driven dissipative nonlinear systems um, in, the, in superconducting circuits. And for many of us, uh, Michelle hardly needs an introduction. Um, and, uh, you know, the, what I think what we can simply say that the scientific family and friends tree cannot really be disentangled from him in this field. Um, and uh, the group continues to be an exciting source of new ideas and demonstrations, uh, particularly in this area that he'll be talking about today. And so without further ado, Michelle, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, thank you, Vela, for this introduction. Um, is everyone uh, hearing me okay? Okay. Yes, I think it's good. So thank you for this introduction and the invitation of, uh, to this uh, virtual um, science colloquium. Um, so um, you will have to forgive me. Uh, I'm not very familiar with uh, uh, this um, type of colloquium. And um, I think the reduced um, bandwidth of the feedback will uh, prevent um, um, the error correction to be done on this um, on this talk. Um, so, <laughs> so <laughs> thank you um, uh, in advance for your forgiveness. So um, the the subject matter of uh, today's colloquium is um, uh, the question of solving um, a basic problem in in quantum information. Uh, in uh, quantum information, uh, which is to prolong the lifetime of a logical uh, qubit. Um, um, essentially, the goal is to prolong it indefinitely, but of course, um, we are still um, working before we, we are running. So the results that I will present today are, are modest uh, com in comparison to this infinite lifetime that we are seeking, but what I think is interesting is the idea that um, 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 are beyond are behind uh, this kind of uh, error correction. So um, we um, at Yale uh, we are implementing a type of error correction which we call hardware efficient, which is based on the uh, the the states of uh, superconducting cavity. So in our approach, uh, as you will see, uh, the qubits are actually um, the superconducting cavities, which, have, um, which are um, essentially uh, catered. Um, they are um, um, by a, a superconducting uh, Josephson junction. So the junction is not the location of the qubit, the qubit is in the cavity. The junction uh, role is to provide the nonlinearity for uh, making operation on the cavity. 
And um, the protocol that I will present, um, uh, which I have uh, um, alluded to in this uh, word, uh, grid states, grid states, uh, um, it's a, is a protocol that was uh, actually originates uh, from ideas um, launched in 2001 by uh, Gottesman, uh, Kitayev, and Preskill. And 2001 is almost uh, pre prehistoric times uh, in quantum information. Um, it's interesting because um, uh, basically when this paper uh, came out, uh, experimentalists uh, dismissed it uh, as uh, too theoretical. Um, too advanced, um, too, too disconnected with experiments. Uh, and uh, by a certain reversal of fortune, now, um, thanks to the work of uh, several groups, uh, we think that uh, this code, uh, the more we study it, the more we think it has a unique experimental potential. So that's uh, what I want to tell you about today. Um, how, uh, what is this code um, uh, and how we can actually implement it uh, experimentally. It's not as uh, hard as we would have thought originally. So in this uh, first uh, uh, slide, um, I have named uh, the, the uh, I have put the authors of our recent paper. Uh, I think you, you, you are seeing my, um, my mouse here, my pointer. So uh, the results have recently appeared in Nature. And I want also to point out to a related uh, paper on the CareCat encoded that uh, appeared uh, in the same volume. So this is uh, uh, our group at Yale uh, of uh, experimental error correction. Um, I would like to immediately point out uh, th three faces. Um, I like I Bush, uh, Stephen Tuza, and Philippe Campagne, who have taken the data that I will present in, uh, in this talk. But I wanted also to acknowledge uh, um, our theory colleagues, um, uh, Steve Gervin, uh, Baptiste Royer, Shruti Puri, uh, Leonid Glassman. And of course, I wanted also to, I would like to, to thank uh, Rob Sholkov, with whom uh, I'm sharing a lab and um, many Eureka moments in the past. Okay, so these are the, the people who have done the work. What is the talk outline? Well, uh, there's, exactly, there's going to be three parts in this talk. Um, I would like to first explain uh, the idea of uh, non-locality for logical qubits, which is an idea that underlines all uh, quantum error correction. And um, specifically, this will be bring us uh, to this non-local encoding uh, of the um, uh, GKP protocol. So I'll explain in the second part uh, this uh, encoding and how we can control it uh, with an ancilla uh, based on uh, a Josephson circuit. And then I'll discuss our experimental setup um, and the results and, and uh, if I have time, the, the future. Okay, so um, what do we mean by non-local wave function? So this is going to be a very, very elementary introduction. So uh, suppose we have a particle and uh, it will have some finite extent, uh, which you can think of some kind of zero point motion. I, denoting here the, the typical size uh, sigma here. And so you have um, this particle and you can put it in two a distant uh, confining box such that the distance between the boxes is much larger than this uh, sort of fuzz uh, on the position of the particle, the quantum fuzz of course. Then you will have, um, uh, you can encode information in this non-local wave function, which will be a superposition of the particle being in the left box and the particle being in the right box. So let's examine this uh, non-local wave function. It is attacked um, in two ways. There are bit flips, which transform theta here, and that changes the, uh, the probability of the superposition. And there are phase flips, which uh, change the relative phase of the superposition. 
So I think you will agree with me that um, local forces, such as a, a difference uh, in potential between these two locations, will induce phase flip, flips, but it will, uh, the, this kind of qubit will be protected against uh, bit flips. You cannot change by local interaction the probability of being to the left or in the left box or in the right box. You can, of course, roll the phase extremely rapidly and scramble the phase, but not uh, this um, theta parameter. So that's, that's the beginning of an idea. But of course, you see, you have uh, still a very fragile qubit because uh, when you make the box the distance, okay, you, you suppress completely the bit flips, but you pay a, a tremendous uh, amount of increase in the phase flip. So this is basically what everyone is after. You know, you, you, you want to store the bit information non-locally, but you want also to um, encode the phase information non-locally. And it, 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 it is, this is the, the icing on the cake, but it seems a bit contradictory. Okay, so there are two strategies for, for basically having your cake and eating it too. So you can encode information in a set of discrete variables, a register of uh, qubits, of physical qubits, which I, um, um, are represented here by these block spheres. So if you have um, uh, this, uh, the, uh, the small n qubits, you will have a Hilbert space of dimension big N equal two to the N. And this is the strategy that is followed in the steam code, the surface code, the color code, uh, all these uh, kind of codes and, and which has been implemented uh, um, by work at uh, Google and Santa Barbara. Okay, but uh, on a completely different axis, you have uh, another type of encoding, which is called the continuous variable encoding, continuous between quotes, because we are going to use uh, discrete states of an oscillator, so it's not that continuous. What we mean by continuous is that the space, uh, unlike here, is a priori unbounded. So you're not declaring in advance how many states of the oscillator you're going to use. And um, representative of uh, these uh, codes are the binomial codes, CAD codes, kitten codes, and the GKP code, uh, which I'm going to tell you about. So the, the advantage, uh, the, if, we, if we look at these two types of directions, so we could say that um, with discrete variables, the problem is that uh, you have a huge overhead and uh, the, um, the continuous variable implementation is uh, more subtle in certain ways and more indirect, but it has um, minimal overhead. That's what we, we um, call uh, uh, um, hardware efficient encoding. And to, to give you a sense of the large overhead of the discrete variable encoding, let's look at the steam code, which is the basis for the surface code and the more sophisticated code. So in that um, code, um, the register uh, has seven qubits, so you get a Hilbert space with 128 dimension. So these um, uh, qubits are represented uh, each by these hexagons and there are links between the hexagon. And so I can um, represent uh, each of the logical states by a superposition of um, a, a register configuration. And I'm not going to go in the detail here, you, you just suffice um, to say that when you go to zero, from zero logical to one logical, all the, uh, the zeros flip into one. But you know there are these interesting symmetries that go around these plaquettes here. The, the, uh, no, the qubit, um, uh, the number of qubits that are one is always even in both uh, the zero and the one. So based on these symmetries, you have uh, certain uh, useful properties which allow you to correct um, the state uh, when an error occurs. Unfortunately, the feedback uh, um, 
is quite complicated. So you see, you need to have um, six channels of feedback uh, that measures uh, this uh, four-way uh, Z um, operators or X operators. And depending on these six syndromes here, you're going to correct uh, the state of your register here, which is represented vertically with this high index. So it's a very, very complicated uh, feedback. In fact, uh, the, um, the number of syndromes, uh, the number of uh, channels of errors that you have to correct is uh, 21. There are seven qubits. Each qubit can fail in along three directions. And um, so it, it's, uh, this is the, the huge overhead. Before you, you do anything, you have to, to monitor continuously uh, 21 error channels. And I'm going to show you that uh, with um, this continuous encoding, things are much less complicated. But uh, before I do that, I have to uh, remind you um, what are the quantum states of uh, a cavity resonator. For, for a register, it's easy. I just need to, in order to give you a configuration, I just uh, tell you which qubits in the register are one and which are not are zero, but uh, here we have to dwell into the, the, the states of a cavity. So I'm sure you're all familiar with um, the, the notion of Fox state. So you have the vacuum here, the cavity. This is a Wigner space, uh, Wigner function representation, which um, shows you a quasi probability in phase space. I and Q are the um, a co two coordinates of the oscillator. You can think of it if you think about an electrical oscillator, let's say an LC circuit, um, this could be the current um, in the inductance and this could be the charge on the capacitance. Or you can think of this I as the in-phase quadrature of the oscillator and Q the, the uh, out-of-phase quadrature. So as we go um, horizontally here, we go to, uh, through the Fox states and um, um, they, they are distinct from each other from, by the number of nodes here, of rings, uh, white rings uh, in the Wigner representation. Now you can do, um, other, you can excite the oscillator in a different way, you can displace uh, the vacuum and that gives you a current state here. The alpha equals two means that uh, um, I, uh, I have uh, displaced uh, the vacuum state by two units and the number, uh, average number of photons that are involved here is two to the power two form. There's an average four photons in this state. I can uh, do another operation. I can take the vacuum and squeeze it uh, which gives you this uh, elongated ellipse uh, in phase space. But what I can do also is I can take two of these coherent states and superpose them uh, coherently and, and get these so-called cat states, which um, I'm not going to talk about today, but which also represent uh, an interesting possibility for encoding quantum information. Okay, so uh, squeeze vacuum. Um, so that is going to, um, um, this is a segue into a GKP because the GKP uh, state, um, let's say uh, the zero logical, is actually made up of um, theoretically infinitely squeezed uh, uh, states which are superposed. So if you look at the wave function, uh, for this state um, in the representation of the oscillator coordinate Q, well, uh, it's a series of uh, delta functions. And uh, when you go from the zero logical to the one logical, all you do is just shift uh, this, um, this wave function by a half uh, a lattice spacing. So you see in which way the, uh, the state, the, the encoding is non-local. After all, if um, let's say the one state would uh, become corrupted and would shift, uh, um, uh, it will, uh, you, you know, you have to shift it by a finite amount uh, actually uh, um, compared to its width. Um, 
to to confuse it with the other states. So that's that's the idea. And uh, the big advantage of this code, uh, even though it looks um, extremely uh, uh, weird from the point of view of the shape of the wave function, it's uh, the, the the operations on the state is are very simple. If you if you can manage to produce these states and correct them, then it's a downhill uh, from there. There's also um, some very very interesting fact which was found only recently. The code is optimal for photon losses. So it, this code was designed to counter a small displacement, but it turns out, um, this is not obvious from this uh, drawing, that um, it's in fact also uh, actually the optimal code if you want to correct against photon losses, which is really the, by far the dominant mechanism of error if you store information in a superconducting cavity. In practice, uh, this infinite set of squeeze states is not realistic. Uh, it's, uh, you, you have to use uh, some finite envelopes, so the squeezing is not um, infinite. Uh, and you get wave functions which have uh, this kind of shape. So it's, um, um, it's a series of peaks and uh, you need to limit the extent of the envelope because otherwise you would have uh, uh, an infinite number of photons in your state and you would suffer um, from um, immediately from uh, photon losses. So um, to, to give you an idea that this code, uh, this non-locality um, um, uh, happens both for phase flip and for bit flip, um, Let's consider these wave functions. So you, the uh, the blue one is the zero, the um, the orange one is the one, uh, both in Q and in the conjugate variable p. Uh, you see uh, they are orthogonal. It's very easy to see uh, uh, this in the Q representation. Not only are they orthogonal, but it takes a finite amount of displacement to confuse them. Now. If I, instead of using zero and one, I, I, I look at the state plus and minus, you see that um, in a piece, uh, in the P representation, they are also completely non-overlapping, these wave functions, which means that there is a protection both for phase flips and uh, for bit flips mm -hmm. at the same time. So that's uh, the, what makes this code so, so interesting. Um, non-locality um, along uh, um, uh, bit flips and face flips. It's useful to look at uh, this code um, uh, from another perspective, which is uh, phase space, and look at uh, the Wigner function. And what uh, I am representing here by these red dots are not a particular wave function, but the manifold of all the superposition. So you take this superposition, a random superposition, and um, the, its a wave function, its a, for summary, its density matrix will produce uh, this Wigner function that consists in a, in a grid. So this is a grid in, a, in phase space. And, um, you can, if you look at uh, the marginal distributions, you will see um, uh, how the wave functions of the various states appear. And you see you have uh, less peaks here in uh, this drawing, and that's more in par with the experimental results that I will show you. The arrows um, here on this figure represent uh, the feedback that we are going to apply, the, the error correction that we're going to apply uh, to this encoding and uh, which produce uh, uh, essentially um, the equivalent of forces in phase space that confine uh, the grid. So there's two types of confinement. There's this uh, blue, little blue arrows confinement, which uh, shrink um, the point of the grid. Um, they, they, uh, these forces maintain uh, the dots localized uh, here. And at the same time, you have these outer arrows um, 
which prevent um, the opposite effect to occur. So if you shrink uh, the, uh, the area here too much, uh, by the uncertainty principle, the, um, the grid will extend in space and you will have then an average of too many photons. So you need to shrink um, the, um, you need uh, to shrink the envelope. So you see, you have to sharpen the peaks, which uh, what is the, the uh, blue arrows do, but you have also um, um, to constrain the envelope. Okay, so uh, we have two jobs to do. Um, basically, install the the, um, uh, the 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 blue arrows in the two direction and the um, and the purple arrows also in two directions. Okay, so now uh, to understand uh, how this is done it's good to um, um, discuss the geometry of translation in phase space so classically suppose you have two translations in uh, in phase space a translation u and a translation v now you can come back uh, to the origin uh, by uh, making um, the opposite of the sum of the translation and uh, classically, uh, when you go around uh, uh, a closed loop like this, nothing happens. But quantum mechanically, you pick up an extra phase factor here, which is proportional to the area uh, enclosed um, by uh, your trajectory. Um, if you use um, this representation of translations of, um, in phase space using these complex numbers A, which um, are uh, substitute for the vectors here, uh, this um, uh, complex number, sorry, alpha and beta, which substitute for u and v. Uh, you can write actually the, the, this phase factor like um, the product of these uh, complex uh, numbers. That's uh, okay. So that allows us to, to, to witness a very interesting fact. So if you make a, a, a certain um, contour here, um, which has um, this uh, clever area, which is um, a certain number of uh, two pi h bar, or essentially a, 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 an integer um, number of action quantum, then uh, um, basically, these two uh, translations here um, will commute. And in fact, here in the following, I'm going to, to choose two action quanta for this uh, square here. And that gives us, if you do the calculation, you have to translate um, in this uh, phase space, normalized phase space by uh, two square root of pi. So, you, what uh, the code says is that uh, these translations by this magic two square root of pi will act as stabilizers. We're going to take a code for which uh, the, the figure is basically invariant by this translation. So this, uh, um, these translations become stabilizers of the code. Um, they represent inside the code uh, the identity and now uh, it's very interesting because we uh, you will just use a very uh, uh, you know greek euclidean uh, geometry here so if um, this total area is four pi h bar so you see this triangle here is an eighth of um, the total area but an eighth of two pi, four pi h bar is uh, pi over two h bar which means that uh, the product of x um, and z and y, but uh, y and minus y are the same here, then uh, that exactly i, uh, which is exactly the polyalgebra. So here in this uh, code, um, you see in order to do an x operation or z operation, all I have to do is to do half of this translation. So instead of doing this uh, stabilizer translation uh, by two square root of pi, if I do a translation by square root of pi, I have done an x or, or z, and, um, and composing them gives you a y. 
So this is extremely, uh, extremely interesting. And, but um, how do we go from the math uh, to uh, quantum superconducting circuits? So we're going to take uh, a system here with uh, two uh, superconducting resonators. The, the qubit is going to live um, in this uh, upper cavity here. It's uh, viewed from the top. It's a box uh, with a post in the middle, and that um, creates a convenient uh, resonator. And um, this will be a high Q cavity. Um, it will be acted upon the, the nonlinearity, the source of nonlinearity in this cavity will be provided by a transmon qubit uh, here, just uh, in fact a single Josephson junction. And we have also a low Q cavity in the system, which is uh, used to read out um, the transmon state. The transmon is going to be an ancilla, which we're going to use to manipulate the state in the high Q cavity. And um, uh, these numbers are, are maybe uh, not for the general audience, maybe only for the specialists, these numbers uh, uh, give you the characteristic of these different elements and uh, they are fairly uh, standard in our field. So the, what was used in this experiment was relatively state-of-the-art uh, elements, but not um, the best elements you would find uh, uh, separately. Uh, there are better cavities and there are better transmons in different uh, experiments. Maybe uh, an important uh, characteristic here is that we can read out uh, this transmon in about uh, 700 nanoseconds and uh, feed back uh, whatever we learn on the cavity uh, back to the cavity. So you see the feedback loop uh, here is um, as a, a, a typical time of a microsecond here. So we, we are going to be able to do measurement on our state, um, which will be, be using to, to detect errors and, uh, and feedback and uh, correct the errors. And amazingly, all these, um, all these actions are done by a single gate, which I have called the Swiss Army knife of uh, the GKP state and GKP encoding. It's uh, uh, this conditional displacement gate. It's, um, it's a gate uh, that um, will um, basically uh, displace uh, the uh, GKP mode cavity in which the, the qubit will live conditionally on the state of this ancilla qubit. Um, in view of the time, I'm not going to um, explain exactly um, the Hamiltonian and why, uh, uh, what are we using? Let's uh, let's describe what happens picturally. So, I, uh, this on the left uh, represents uh, a quantum state of the cavity, and here, just to simplify, I have chosen a squeeze state, but I could have uh, taken any state, uh, uh, a cat state. Uh, uh, a fog state. Um, it's just here for illustrative purposes. So I'm going to sequentially describe the protocol. So uh, we uh, first uh, do a, a pi over two, sorry. Um, oops, um, so we first do a pi over two uh, pulse on the ancilla, and so we prepare it in a superposition of uh, ENG. And then uh, uh, what we do is that uh, we um, send um, a radiation to the cavity, microwave radiation, which takes uh, uh, this uh, center of gravity of the state, which we call alpha, and increase it to this point. But uh, you see that uh, in displacing the state, uh, we have um, actually rotated the states uh, conditionally on whether e, you have the qubit in E or G. And then uh, there is a sort of uh, clever echo uh, here sequence. So all this is uh, some, some kind of big echo sequence to correct um, all these aberrations. So we go back uh, to the origin. Then uh, we put uh, a pi pulse on the qubit, uh, so we invert uh, G and E. 
we uh, do the, the, the same uh, thing again, but inverting uh, the drive uh, here of the cavity. And finally, when we come back here, um, we've um, actually displaced uh, the cavity, but condition on the state of the qubit. So this is what we call the, condi the conditional displacement gate. And by uh, doing this over and over again, we um, actually can do everything uh, that uh, the protocol uh, requires. There's um, something really nice uh, um, in this gate is that uh, the displacement uh, is still, uh, uh, can be anything we want. Here I have shown a displacement along the imaginary part of alpha or along the, the P coordinate. But we could uh, take, uh, we could do any axis and any length we want. Uh, we just have to change the amplitude and phase of this uh, square pulse. Okay, so um, to give you just a very brief idea of things, how things work, is that suppose that uh, um, a logical uh, qubit, uh, which corresponds to this wave function, has, has suf suffered an error and has being translated to the right. So by doing this protocol um, and uh, thanks to the echo, in fact, we, we will uh, um, record um, uh, the, um, what has happened by the fact that um, this displacement epsilon is mapped uh, onto the uh, qubit, which uh, has been, uh, which, which is in the equatorial plane. And um, it was initially uh, pointing along plus x, but after this protocol, now the qubit um, is as rotated in its equatorial plane by an angle which is proportional to this displacement. So this is uh, the, um, uh, something absolutely interesting. We can use uh, this property to read out the state, uh, but you know, you want, can you re use it also to correct. Um, just to show you that uh, this, uh, uh, this conditional displacement uh, gate works, uh, we can do it uh, on a, a, a displacement here and record what happens as a function of the uh, length of the displacement here. And um, we get a, um, an interference fringe similar to um, a Ramsey fringe. And uh, that uh, allows us to calibrate um, this um, conditional gate and to make sure we, uh, we can do a, a conditional uh, displacement uh, with the, the length uh, that we, we want. Now, um, in order to implement this uh, series of, uh, of um, uh, forces that I've shown you in, um, in phase space, uh, um, which is to sharpen uh, the peaks and to trim the envelope, we have to um, repeat uh, this uh, feedback protocol involving uh, uh, a CD gate and then uh, an, an unconditional displacement D. And we, this feedback loop has to be repeated uh, four times. Uh, two times uh, uh, for the um, Q, um, uh, direction and uh, two times for the PD this uh, direction. We have to sharpen uh, and trim the envelope in both directions. And um, this uh, elementary cell here of uh, four feedback loop is repeated uh, continuously. And um, I, am, I have to point out that uh, there are recent developments which uh, actually would replace uh, this uh, a, a measurement feedback loop by an autonomous uh, feedback, which would mean that you don't have to go to, um, to you don't have to involve external circuitry. Every, everything can be done at the uh, level of the circuitry, of the uh, superconducting circuit. That's, that's extremely promising. And uh, these are the results. So um, this, uh, this is what we call manifold stabilization. We, by implementing uh, this force in phase space, we can uh, uh, coax the, the state of the cavity to be inside this uh, GKP manifold. And uh, so uh, this data shows uh, the route to convergence uh, when 
this is flat. In fact, actually, you have converged uh, towards um, uh, a logical uh, state, which is actually mixed uh, in this case. And we, we find uh, this uh, grid pattern um, in phase space, or more, more, um, uh, more correctly, the reciprocal of phase space, because what we measure here is the characteristic function, which is the Fourier transform uh, of the Wigner function. But a grid uh, in direct space is also a grid in Fourier space, so this data is uh, completely equivalent to the, um, the Wigner function uh, uh, representation. So, um, after 200 rounds of stabilization, uh, you get this stabilized manifold, but of course, uh, these stabilized manifolds um, 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 implement an unknown state in the manifold. In order to fix that state, you have to do a measurement. So, for instance, you measure X, and uh, depending on the result, uh, you, 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 you will flip, uh, you will uh, make a, a displacement to or not to get uh, the state that you want. So this is how we can prepare a, a state uh, that we want in advance. Michel, sorry, a quick question. So when you were showing the convergence, there was some, there, there were some oscillations. Yes, a period of like yes. Three rounds. Yes. Can you comment yes. what that is? Yes, well, you, you expect oscillations because you see um, um, the, uh, the, uh, by the way, um, the protocol depends on the, on the parameter that has to be adjusted. So you see there are displacement here, which uh, depend, uh, are done, uh, are small displacements, uh, which you have to optimize the, and which depend on the amount of photon losses in your in, in your system. So you see, uh, um, if um, if you have a lot of photon loss, uh, you cannot have sharp peaks. So it's useless to to aim for two sharp peaks. So there's a, a sort of adaptation of uh, this parameter to the the um, uh, the photon loss rate and the speed uh, the speed at which you can do the correction. And um, you see the, uh, in fact, uh, Alec, uh, who is uh, listening, um, can correct me, but this kind of oscillation is due to the contradictory nature of the, uh, these various forces. You see, um, so when uh, uh, the uncertainty principle um, uh, is such that when you try to sharpen one direction, you extend the, the state in the other direction. So you, you have this kind of opposing, uh, opposing forces. Um, and so the, the, we actually, we, we are expecting this um, convergence to be oscillatory. Uh, the the uh, dashed uh, lines are actually the, the result of the simulation. And um, it's basically the uh, uncertainty principle in action that uh, you see here. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, Michelle, Michelle, actually, there is another question. Um, yes. Christian, uh, could you, you can unmute yourself. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, I just have a question about this uh, epsilon parameter that you mentioned in the talk. Mm -hmm. uh, so how is that actually optimal? So um, this is, um, uh, that's a, uh, that's a great question. So, Why do you just sort of group in? So at uh, the level of our um, uh, experiment, um, this parameter was optimized uh, entirely by simulation. So um, basically it was done by hand, uh, I would say. <laughs> um, but uh, now uh, Steve Govin and Baptiste Royer have developed ideas uh, by which, uh, and, and um, Mazia Miraimi also, um, there is a, a much better understanding of uh, this kind of compromise and this uh, essentially can be computed by theory. It, it, uh, there's the different okay, uh, problems which I, uh, I am not uh, really um, I am just skim, uh, skimming over them, 
But um, this is a Markovian protocol, so it's not even obvious that it is that optimum. So Markovian means that um, basically um, we, the, the, we, all these steps are completely independent of each other, and we, we don't uh, try to optimize uh, over the whole history. So this uh, could be a surprise. Um, so you, you first have to understand whether this Markovian approach is close to the optimum. And then uh, once um, you are convinced about this, you, you have to uh, formulate exactly the right, um, um, the right stabilizers for these finite uh, extent uh, wave functions. You see, the, the, um, the, in the original paper, the stabilizers are taken to be the uh, the infinite uh, state, uh, infinite extent uh, state stabilizers. But uh, actually, uh, because your, your envelope has a finite extent, uh, your stabilizers are not exactly these translations that I have mentioned. They are modified uh, version of uh, which have some uh, dissipator. You, you need to involve some dissipator part in the stabilizer. So they are not, uh, these stabilizers are, are not uh, observable uh, anymore. They have some uh, irreversible content. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, yes, so this, um, so the, the state preparation is uh, incredibly simple. So once you have stabilized the manifold, so you know you've uh, prepared the uh, states with a, a, a good probability which are inside this encoding manifold. All you have to do is measure the characteristic function here at uh, this precise location, the uh, a location corresponding to x. You remember the, the operators x, y, z are in the middle of a, of a square. So here, if you measure at this point, uh, depending on the value you find, uh, you will uh, you will have prepared uh, plus x or minus x state here because you found the negative uh, value. You've prepared uh, a negative uh, minus uh, x uh, state. Okay. Um, so you can uh, actually in this way uh, prepare um, all kinds of states. You can prepare the x state, the y state magic state. And um, this is in the square code, um, which has this uh, rectangular grid. But uh, as I'm going to show you in, um, in a few moments, there's also a competing code, which is the hexagonal code, uh, in which the, um, uh, the basic um, um, uh, cell uh, is not a rectangle, but uh, actually a, a diamond corresponding to the hexagonal lattice. So I have to explain this um, a little bit. Uh, so here I have uh, represented uh, the Wigner function of two states, uh, zero, the zero logical and the one logical in this uh, rectangular um, uh, cell uh, encoding. And you see that um, basically the, um, the zero the, the, um, is different from one in the fact that uh, this dot here is red uh, in the zero state and it becomes blue in the one state. Remember, this is the location of the Z uh, operator. You can look at it also as a translation along uh, X uh, of, um, of this, uh, this uh, array of dots. Now, you see that um, in this uh, square code, uh, um, the, uh, the, the operators x, uh, y, and z uh, correspond to vectors with different length. And uh, the hexagonal code uh, has the merit uh, that uh, the x, uh, y, and z uh, operators have the same length. So they will uh, suffer basically exactly the same fate uh, uh, when the uh, cavity is uh, attacked uh, by uh, photon losses. And in some sense, uh, this is a more advantageous code. So let me, uh, let me show you this on the experimental results. So this is this um, um, cell here for the um, 
the square code. So we have prepared a, a state here, minus x. And uh, this is um, a state uh, that actually corresponds to minus y, because uh, the location of y now is in the, the center of this diamond. And here, the um, x operator, the y operator, and the z operator at the same as the same length. And this shows um, in um, the lifetime of the various states. So in these plots, um, what I am representing here, in the, the open dots correspond to the free decay of the states, the states uh, x, y, and z. So you prepare them and then you don't correct and you, you watch their free decay. And uh, the closed dots uh, represent uh, the lifetime of these states, but uh, with the correction on. And you see that in the square code, um, you have uh, uh, both uh, the x and the z states, uh, which live quite long. But uh, the y states, they, okay, they improve, of course, uh, um, um, but um, but they are still uh, they don't uh, live uh, all that long. So there's this asymmetry uh, between um, the lifetime of the x z state and the y state. On the other hand, uh, for the hexagonal code, you see all these uh, three states are corrected in exactly the same way. Uh, you have a more or less a doubling of the lifetime. So uh, we have to compare this, um, this uh, doubling of the lifetime um, with um, another encoding in which uh, we would encode the information solely using the zero and the one fog state of the cavity. And that encoding uh, lives uh, for 250 microseconds. It's not correctable, um, but um, but it lives slightly longer. So what we say here is that in this hexagonal code, we have not uh, gone past break-even. Break-even is that when what happens when your, uh, your correction at least matches the best uh, encoding possible in the system. Um, yeah, you have to um, you have to recoup uh, the your effort, uh, your all the the complexity of the encoding, and the correction has to be recouped uh, be, before you claim victory. So that's what break even is. Um, if if you compare the numbers here, you see that for x and z, we 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 get somewhat above. Uh, 250 microseconds, but I think the title of glory of this experiment is that unlike many experiments in a quantum error correction, we correct simultaneously all the uh, possible errors on X, Y, and Z. Okay, so I'm, um, I've, um, I've gotten to the end uh, of my uh, 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 allotted time, so let me um, say that um, there are next steps. Uh, obviously, uh, we, we have to, uh, there is a, a huge part of the errors, the remaining errors actually come from the ancilla. And this is something that um, we have to improve. Uh, there is this um, uh, fault tolerance that I have announced for the one qubit and the two qubit gates. And this has, of course, to be, um, to be seen experimentally. So these are my conclusions. Uh, um, so we have um, the we've presented an experiment where all errors of a logical qubit are simultaneously corrected. Um, we the the break-even point uh, we are very optimistic about it. It should be crossed uh, um, by uh, improving um, rather trivial. Um, 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 uh, problems in the present experiment. Um, so we are very uh, optimistic on the, the uh, outcome of the future experiments along this line. And of course, um, I have listed all the, the uh, interesting perspective of this research direction. So the Clifford gates are, are fault tolerant. This is extremely um, interesting. For instance, the C0 as um, is a mapping uh, that is um, a sort of conditional displacement, a one qubit uh, conditionally uh, 
displace the other. It turns out that um, this operation is very similar to what we know how to do already with amplifiers. So we, we are quite confident that we, we um, understand this kind of uh, CNOT operation. The, as I mentioned, um, this experiment uh, does the feedback uh, by uh, going um, to the outside of the cryostat and uses a computer to send back signal, but it can be, all this correction can be done autonomously, which uh, would simplify enormously the wiring of the uh, error correction. And um, in the context of um, this uh, uh, paradigm where you use a, a cavity, a superconducting cavity to, to store your qubit, and you use the Josephson junction only as an ancilla for the operation, uh, these kind of numbers uh, look uh, feasible and they would uh, really increase uh, tremendously already the, the computing capacity of, uh, of this uh, superconducting qubit. So on that optimistic note, I would like to thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. And, uh, thank you to the audience for, uh, for your attention. Um, we now open to questions, post-talk. Um, I see one from Alex. You may go ahead and unmute yourself. <laughs> Hello, Michelle. Hello, Alex. Uh, for the hexagonal code with the different uh, lifetimes being equal, uh, that must do something to render the environment oblivious to the state of the system, right? Um, what, what exactly do you mean for the lifetime uh, X, Y, Z? Um, uh, yes, for X, Y, Z, uh, you sort of removed a bias um, that existed in the, um, the square code where um, decays would tend to happen more in one state than the other. Yes, maybe I, I, I can explain uh, uh, somewhat um, uh, what happens here yeah, in, in a sort of simple-minded way. So I, uh, I think the specialist should, uh, should um, be tolerant with this uh, unwaving explanation. But one way to think about it is that, um, you see, when you are in the X state or the Z state, uh, in some sense, you're not uh, very far from the origin. Uh, so you have less photon numbers than if you are in the Y state. So that's a, that's a, a crude and waving uh, um, explanation. Um, you see, the, um, there's a sort of, uh, um, the Y states contains on average more photon than the X and Z states. So it's more susceptible to losses. So th th this is the kind of asymmetry we are correcting in this hexagonal code where now the X, uh, the Y and the Z state have exactly the same uh, average photon number. And uh, if you want the code has become isotropic in, uh, in phase space. We're correcting against uh, uh, along three directions, and you may say, "Well, but uh, it's still uh, you still have three main directions." But it turns out that uh, um, this um, uh, the symmetry uh, um, is sufficient to 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 be completely isotropic. Hmm. Thank you. Um, with the next hand up was Anton's. Thanks. Um, so uh, you you briefly mentioned all the ingredients of a fault tolerant man quantum computer uh, computation, uh, but uh, there was something that uh, that I missed, and that's the preparation of a uh, magic state but you did show it during the talk. So can you please uh, say a few more words about how you're preparing the magic state? Uh, yes, so, so um, that's a very good point. So uh, maybe, um, so I, I said that, uh, by the way, I, I, I don't want uh, to propagate uh, some false hope uh, here. 
So um, in this in this GKP encoding, all the Clifford operations are fault tolerant, but uh, obviously uh, a magic state uh, preparation is not uh, a Clifford operation. Right. So um, so it will not be done fault tolerantly. You can do a, a magic state uh, preparation simply by uh, preparing the qubit uh, on a, on, in a non-Clifford uh, 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 state and basically encoding the cavity uh, with that state. So um, um, I, I, um, I just want to say that this state can be prepared and while uh, when it is prepared, uh, uh, you can detect small displacements and uh, stabilize it uh, like the others, but uh, it's true that um, we would not uh, prepare this magic state uh, for tolerantly. Right, so, so, so this is exactly what I was wondering. Uh, so what is the, how would you prepare uh, the state not fault tolerantly? What, what, so, so, so I think it takes uh, taking some kind of initial state and encoding it usually, or what does, what, which steps oh. are actually required to come there? So basically, uh, let's say a general um, idea that uh, is behind all this is that uh, um, you can uh, you can pretty much uh, using uh, your qubit, uh, you your your the 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 principle here is that uh, if you can manipulate uh, your qubit uh, along uh, uh, all directions, if you if you have full control of your qubit. And if you have this CD gate, um, you have actually, um, you have universal control on your cavity. So there will be always an algorithm that uh, prepares any state. Um, um, but of course, they may, this may involve um, operations that may not be fault tolerant. So, so we, um, this magic state shows that we can prepare any state of the cavity, but of course, um, um, the, the, the gates that, we can, that would be fault tolerant in this encoding are only the, the, the Clifford operation, which is, uh, you know, um, I mean, that's not even something that uh, the, the surface code can claim. So it's, it's not bad. Yeah, yeah, I understand the, that it's uh, that it's similar to how the surface code works. Uh, also, so also related question: You wrote once again some expressions for the C node gate, but can you also provide some explanation about how it would work in practice? How would you couple two of such qubits? Ah, yes. Um, so yes. So so this is um, so. Um, by the way, you see, it's a sort of um, um, it's a, it's a, this transformation um, is um, something we we love because um, if you think about it, it uh, it resembles the functioning of um, some. Uh, it's it's very similar to um, how, let's say, a two-mode squeezing amplifier would uh, is working. This kind of uh, transformation is ex essentially uh, what you have. Uh, it's very close to what you have in um, in amplifiers. In fact, uh, if you look at this expression, you see that um, this is uh, amplifying because uh, if you look at the number of photons that you have in the final state, uh, let's say if you had uh, one photon uh, in um, in um, the the two cavity to start uh, to start with, you see that this kind of transformation actually is not energy preserving. Um, it's phase space volume preserving, but not uh, energy preserving. And uh, we we are actually um, so. Uh, for instance, Michael Hatridge has implemented this kind of transformation with. Uh, you know, um, uh, here you have a coefficient one in front of, actually minus one in front of P and plus one in front of X. This is necessary for the conservation. Uh, this change of sign is necessary for the conservation of phase space volume, but amplifier circuits, they basically do this kind of uh, transformation with an arbitrary coefficient here. So in fact, um, all we have to do is to take uh, these well-known uh, 
uh, protocols in which you have a transmon which uh, spans two cavities. So you, you, the, so the hardware that is required is simply a transmon between the two cavities on which you want to make an operation. So that's extremely advantageous in terms of uh, hardware. You need a bridge transmon to do um, uh, this C naught on, um, on the logic of qubits. Only one transmon to do um, a C naught uh, on logic of qubits. That's a huge, um, yeah, a huge gain in hardware. All right, thanks. All right, Babak. Yeah, uh, thank you for a great talk. Uh, I was just wondering I, I, uh, when you were explaining the, the protection that you get by preparing these states. So when you showed the wave function in say X, you have the sort of squeeze superposition. Um, and then in P, you don't have, you, you have the two, you have the sign cancellation, right? Mm. Um, so that, appears to say that if, uh, so in X, I need a finite uh, translation to create errors, but in P, I don't, right? Yes. Do I understand uh, that correctly? So uh, how do you, so, so do you need to protect against uh, sort of P translations there? Yes, so, so if you want, um, let, let's look at these four panels and, um, and I'll, I'll answer your, your comment. So. Indeed, uh, here in the Q representation, it's quite clear that uh, zero and one has, are disconnected because there are no overlap. In, uh, in the P representation, the disconnection is much less obvious because we see that there is an overlap between the peak, but when you integrate, when you look at the scalar product, in fact, um, the fact that you have minus here and plus, uh, in fact, provides a cancellation, but it's less obvious than in this representation. So in order to, to ascertain that uh, we have no uh, phase flip either, we, we have to take uh, the plus x state and the minus x state and see uh, what happens to them. And for those, uh, this P representation is clear. Mm -hmm. We see that uh, the wave function in P uh, that represents this state is also as this, uh, uh, non-spatial uh, overlap. So we can immediately see that uh, the encoding uh, for, uh, uh, is, is uh, non-local for phase flips either. Mm -hmm. So if you want, um, I am uh, producing these two panels here, uh, this one and this one for completeness, but uh, the argument can be made uh, only with these two panels here. But uh, I have to change representation when yeah. I get I mean the plus and minus state. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, it's, a little bit, uh, it's a little bit uh, more obvious here. Uh, if you want, um, there's always, uh, when you take the various states, they will be always um, uh, far from each other in this uh, vectorial sense. Right. right. Overlap. Yeah, thank you. Um, I see another question from Alex. I have another question about uh, um, X, Y, and Z, and the uh, mm. and the, and the square square state in yeah. uh, a normal, uh, you know, basic uh, vector algebra. And looking at this picture, X and Z would be adequate for spanning this two-dimensional space uh, is, is the reason that we're introducing why because we need to keep track of a berry phase or something like that? Yes, uh, um, uh, in some sense you, you, that would be a way to, to think about it. So why, why uh, actually classically a product of uh, translation uh, that uh, returns to the origin leaves everything invariant. Well, the state uh, um, is not complex. The state doesn't have a phase. But quantum mechanically, uh, you have essentially this phase uh, degree of freedom. And whereas um, a, a closed loop like this doesn't do anything to the amplitude, it, uh, it modifies the phase. So 
uh, yes, in, uh, in fact, uh, yes, um, a phase that depends on an area like this that has been covered is, is the Berry phase. There's no, if you want, uh, the, the classical states uh, don't have any Berry phase. So we are taking advantage here of uh, this Berry phase to do operation. In fact, uh, in fact, uh, I'm glad you mentioned this because uh, this experiment um, looks like um, here um, um, this uh, experiment, this calibration here looks like an ordi your ordinary Ramsey fringe, but uh, what it does is essentially a berry phase measurement. It's a um, it's an interference between two types of loops. Uh, closed loops in, uh, in phase space. It measures the, the amount of phase enclosed by both loops, which phase which classically uh, would not exist. So it's a, it's a, very, it's a very phase uh, interference experiment. Uh, Thank you. Okay, um, Sarah? Hi, can you hear me? Um, yes. Thank you. Um, thanks for this awesome talk. Uh, I'm wondering if the ancilla error, which is limiting the overall system uh, uh, error corrected T1, is just basically due to this ancilla T1 influencing um, the cavity state. Um, and I'm also wondering if you can tell anything else about the autonomous um, correction, how, how in hardware this autonomous error correction is going to be done. Okay, um, okay, so I'll, I'll answer the first question and I will uh, let uh, Steve Gervin, who is in the audience, answer the second question here. <laughs> so, or Baptiste, uh, I, I have seen that Baptiste maybe is still here. I, I, see, the, I see the face of Steve, I, I don't see the face of Baptiste at the moment. Okay, uh, the first question. So, yes, so interestingly, uh, the um, it's not too much the, the defacing rate of the ancilla that poses problem. Um, that, that could be, uh, that could be uh, uh, actually uh, mitigated by doing longer measurements. The, the problem is the T1 of the ancilla because uh, uh, a T1 error, if the ancilla flips um, prior to the measurement, that um, that creates an error that propagates back uh, to uh, the the logical qubit. So this is a, a curse of a quantum error correction that you cannot imagine from a classical setting. In a classical setting, if you don't make a good measurement, well, uh, well, you you don't um, assess correctly the error, but you are not uh, polluting. <laughs> it's only the knowledge about the state uh, that. Uh, you get wrong. Here in, um, in quantum mechanics, there is a back propagation of this, uh, this kind of errors, which, which make our job uh, much more complicated. So not only there are more channels for errors, but um, if you make um, measurements that are faulty in a certain sense, uh, they, they, um, the, you entangle the, the, um, the qubit, uh, your logical qubit and the environment in the wrong way and you propagate um, um, measurement error. So you absolutely need to, to correct this and the, what we think is the way out of this problem is to use another cavity instead of a transmon as an ancilla and this cavity could for instance contain a cat state which has uh, essentially no T1 error, only um, T2 error. So, here you would have an ancilla that would be perfect for the job. And uh, now I am <laughs> I'm, I'm going to let um, Steve uh, explain to us how the correction can be autonomous. Um, that's quite fantastic. Um, um. Okay, Baptiste is the expert, but uh, I will try to get the general idea. So, um, it's a kind of um, cooling protocol. I mean, suppose, suppose you wanted to create 
the, uh, uh, the vacuum state in the cavity, the, the fog state zero, well, that's not hard to do if you have a cold bath uh, to which you can couple and then spontaneous emission will remove photons from your system and never put any back because the temperature is zero and eventually you'll re reach the desired state. So the autonomous protocols uh, do a kind of a much fancier than that bath engineering in which uh, you cool the system towards uh, the state that maximizes the values of the, the stabilizers, uh, which then guarantees that it's this finite energy um, uh, GKP state. The details are uh, about to be described in a, a very a long paper with an extremely long uh, supplementary material, which will be on the archive in a few days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a sort of uh, very clever um, bat engineering, um, 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 basically artificial dissipation that cools uh, to the desired manifold. What what is amazing is that um, it doesn't still uh, it still um, doesn't require very fancy gates. Like uh, you know, in principle, you can cool to any any desired state, but um, often we find that uh, the hardware that is necessary to for for cooling to an arbitrary state can be quite complicated. Here, it it looks amazingly simple. In fact. Uh, doesn't necessitate anything else than what we um, what we uh, control already. Um, I think that there's one other point in the chat uh, from Charlie, uh, who is pointing out that uh, in an earlier question, uh, the, he thinks that the uh, and Charlie, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the idea of one of the early questions might have been whether the why. Uh, operation or, or correction is redundant in some way. Um, uh, if I interpreted that correctly, Charlie, please. Yeah, I just, yeah, I just think that I, I think that the I can't remember who asked the question. Maybe it was Alex. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, um, uh, so, I think, so this, I think, he, I think uh, he didn't get his answer. Uh, <laughs> so, so that gives me a, a, a very good um, uh, uh, occasion to explain the difference uh, between. Uh, what we call face flips and um, um, bit flips. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'll, um, okay, I think we have to go back to to the beginning here of the talk. So, um, so we call a, a bit flips and face flips the the generators of errors, but um, so. You can uh, create all possible errors by combining a flip and phase flip. So you can say that all the errors are combinations of two uh, basic errors, which you can multiply you uh, with each other. You, you, uh, but um, in practice, uh, when you are um, uh, when you want to uh, see how well your error correction uh, works. You have to think in terms of error channels. So um, you uh, think about uh, in NMR terms. So in NMR, you have uh, T1. That's um, basically process that the, the uh, change your magnetization. Um, and then uh, you have um, a T2. But T2 actually, um, um, if you think about it, uh, there are potentially three types of errors because uh, the off-diagonal element uh, have a phase. So, so you could have two directions but uh, for, for T2 errors, but uh, in NMR, you have an isotropy of uh, everything around the magnetic field. Uh, so basically, um, the, the contraction of the block vector um, in the equatorial plane uh, occurs um, um, essentially isotropically. But uh, a priori, there are uh, three directions in which the block vector uh, is decreasing. And these are, um, you, you have to correct um, 
all these errors. Um, so if you want uh, the Y errors uh, can be done by a combination of bit flips and face flip, but it doesn't mean that if you suppress, um, if you witness that uh, both X and uh, Z survive, Y uh, would not be attacked. Um, So I, there's a difference in, uh, in showing that your X state uh, and your uh, Z state survive uh, and saying that you've corrected the uh, bit flips and face flips. It or seems like the language that you're- way to, to think about it is that face flips will transform uh, 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 X into minus X, but they will also uh, uh, transform uh, y into minus y. So uh, just witnessing that um, x, uh, e the uh, x states are conserved uh, is not sufficient. You also have to show that uh, the y states are conserved. Do, do I, uh, I answer your, your question? Uh, am I answering your question, Charlie? Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I guess what I'm, I'm at the border of, un of understanding any of this, so <laughs> forgive me if I'm, saying something, it sounds like the, the language of bit flips and phase flips is one where there's a natural, let's say cylindrical symmetry. There's, a, there's an axis to the block sphere, which is the zero and the one, and there's a circumferential direction, which is isotropic. And so that's a mm -hmm. kind of an, a natural basis to use the language of bit flips yes, and phase but, flips. But you and what you're saying is that there's a rectangular, you could just, just as easily describe it in a Cartesian frame. And then the Cartesian frame, you, you worry about all three. No, 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 no. Is I, that not the point? No, 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 no. The point is that you, you have to, uh, to distinguish between what is called the error generators and the error channels. So in a qubit, there are, um, there are uh, three channels for errors. You could have uh, three noisy fields in perpendicular direction that would create uh, all your errors. And these are three um, random fields uh, um, are uh, statistically independent. You, mm. can, uh, you can recreate uh, this noisy uh, independent field uh, using only two generators and smartly combining them, but you will need correlations uh, between them because, uh, for instance, in order to make a Y, um, uh, a y error, a, y, um, a, a noisy field along Y error, you will need co to combine uh, bit flips and face flips. So, so if you want, uh, with uh, these bit flip and face flips generators, if you want to reproduce three noisy uh, fields uh, along uh, X, Y, and Z, you have to introduce correlations between bit flips and face flips. This is, this is super interesting and I wanna learn more about it, but I think maybe not taking up the time of everybody on the colloquium <laughs> to do it. Thanks, Michel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that we're, uh, we're oh, well just, over. Just, oh. just, uh, just because there's only, there seems to be only bit flips and, and face flips doesn't mean we have to work and, and protect three, uh, simultaneously three error channels. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, th I think we'll, we'll, we'll let Alex have one, one, the one last question and then we'll conclude. Alex, go ahead. Does, uh, X, Y, and Z uh, complete the story or are they just sort of the three nearest neighbors to the vacuum state and uh, really we have as many uh, error channels as we have dots in our uh, GKP state? Oh, um, uh, Alex, you should not really, uh, oh, I, I think um, this uh, question that you're posing, um, in fact, um, is, is a good one because you see, um, let's see, I have to go to these uh, cartoons here. Um, um, so this series of uh, 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 um, uh, blue dots and red dots are the Wigner functions of uh, the, the code words in phase space, okay? Um, now, you see that uh, um, w w the zero and the one logical in involve many dots. The vacuum state in this representation would be just a big dot at the origin. 
So no state here is uh, close to the vacuum. They are quite excited actually because uh, the extent um, goes far away. On the other hand, uh, the dots that you see here are smaller than the, the, the dot that you would have for the vacuum state. So none of these states, uh, whether they are X, Y, Z states, uh, are very close to the vacuum. They are quite excited states. The, the, uh, what happens in the uh, hexagonal code world is that uh, when I, um, I go to the uh, X, Y, and Z state, I, just, I would just need to rotate uh, by uh, 120 degrees these figures. So they are isotropic. So the, the plus and minus Z um, state, the plus and minus Y state, and the plus and minus X state, they are just um, uh, transformed by uh, a simple 120 degree rotation. But the, all these states are quite different from the vacuum. They are simply uh, different in the same way. All right, and I think with that we'll conclude. Um, thanks everyone for attending. Um, as uh, noted before, at the beginning of the talk, in two weeks,